the open source creative podcast episode 49 community and photography with pat david this is the open source creative podcast a podcast where i ramble on about creativity process and open source software i'm jason van gumster your host and driver on the road to creative freedom this week we're talking with pat david pat's focus is on photography and it's actually got him really involved with a whole slew of image processing software and applications on the free and open source side of things. Most notable among those is GIMP. While he hasn't been writing code for GIMP, he's still heavily involved with the development effort and, and sort of a kind of a public relations kind of thing. And he's also been responsible for building the GIMP website, along with a bunch of other ones, including Raw Therapy, Darktable, and Digicam. And in this vein of websites and the open source community and these applications, he's actually responsible for creating pixels.us, P-I-X-L-S dot U-S. Uh, it's a it's a community site with a focus on photography and image editing and, and those sorts of things because um, he, he saw that there was a need for it. And it's a pretty cool forum to go check out. Um, he and I talk about all of this and while well, also t talking on all manner of other topics along the way. It's a long episode. Uh, we talk about art, photography, and typography all the way over to open source communities and the, uh, the, the, the hate to developer ratio. Um, also, one of the things to note is I, I have new gear. I have new things set up here and um, I'm still working with trying to figure out some parts of it. So you'll, you'll notice that in the episode because for one thing, um, I am now recording using a droid cam from my phone's camera because my webcam is like 12 years old and this gives us better fidelity. Droid cam is actually the application on the Android device is uh, it still looks like it's closed source, but the application, uh, the client interface for it from connecting to it on my, my PC, that is actually open source. It's on GitHub and all those sorts of things. So um, that's working out fairly well. But the problem is I'm still figuring out some of the things on it. And I, being someone who has shot video in the past and worked with it, I in my head, I have it locked in. If I'm going to uh, be shooting video with any sort of setup, I tend to lock the exposure because I figure if I'm working, if I'm shooting and the lighting changes, I can adjust the exposure manually because that, and then you don't have the weird sort of pulsing in and out of like the auto iris and that sort of thing. Problem is my phone is over there and I am right here. And so being able to do that kind of uh, control doesn't really, I don't have that control while I'm not, while I'm actually recording. That means um, that's not going to work right that's it's just not going to work uh so i i realized that while recording and so there'll be moments in there if you're watching the, this is on video on youtube uh there'll be moments in there where i'm just really really dark that's because i set the other exposure through i have recording during daylight um i have a nice little window over here i set my exposure on my phone and then the sun went behind the clouds as i was recording bummer but that's that's one part of that. So you'll, you'll notice that, but I also have other things. I've got this little boom van. I have, uh, I switched out from using the, the headset that I was using before. Now I have different headphones and I have, well, I, I have a, a, a new mic on order, but, uh, that, that hasn't come in yet. So I'm actually using this old microphone here that I, I had from <laughs> 20 over 20 years ago. Uh, audio, quality on it still i think fairly decent work and it uh, jacks into the audio interface that i have and and it works reasonably well it's just uh it's a little soft and it is ancient like my webcam more old than my webcam was so hopefully i'll be getting uh a, a replacement mic to fix all that but in the meantime uh the biggest pro challenge i have is i like to move around and um with this, it's it's I get better audio quality than I had on the headset, but I don't get to move around as much, and so uh, I'm dealing with that. The other thing, I don't know if you can see it in the camera. Uh, this 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 mic arm was built for a heavier camera, and this is a very old and dinky, uh, very fairly light stick cam. So um, I don't, well, yeah, I don't think I can. I'm gonna I'm not gonna adjust the camera here, but uh, suffice it to say, I'll just lift this and be a little audio jitter for those of you just on audio. I'm weighing this down with a giant big care of compressed air so that it does, the, uh, the mic stand doesn't move away from me. So yeah, that's fun. Anyway, that's, that's rambling. Uh, oh, I will know in, in, the, in this episode, um, as with all of the episodes I set the, 
the explicit flag is up and flying with this one. So there's not much holding back in terms of language or subject matter. So if you're sensitive to those sort of things, uh, you have been duly warned. So just letting you know on that. Uh, the other show related thing that I'm gonna, I want to talk about is uh, I still haven't gotten the, the discuss comments working with the theme that I'm using for, uh, for, the, for the podcast website. I still think having comments on the site is very important. So I'm working to resolve that. I don't think I want to fix getting discuss working there. Just, there's just too many other problems with discuss to, uh, to do that. So I'm, I'm looking into other options to do that. If you have any suggestions, I'm down for listening to them. Um, because I still, like I said, I think, I think having comments on the episode is, is super important. Um, and I want to make sure that we have that, but I don't think discuss is the way at this point. Um, but the only other thing left here is that, that I don't have any real interest in sponsors and, and subscription things for this show, but I do pay for my own hosting to produce it. And, um, and so if you like it and you want to help me cover some of those costs, I do write books and I have a little bits of merch for sale on the resources section of opensourcecreative.org. Uh, right now it's like a mug and a t-shirt and I'll be adding more stuff soon. Woo! <laughs> yeah. So but if, if any of that appeals to you, go check it out. In the meantime, let's get on to that interview. Oh. We're going to toast marshmallows, are we? Could be. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, we are starting the episode. <laughs> and I have here with, our, with us guesting, guesting with us, Pat David. Um, he has been around the open source and creative area for a long time. So, Pat, if you could give us, give us an introduction to yourself. Ooh, hi, I'm Pat David. Some of you may know me from the GIMP project, uh, where I tend to be as loud as I possibly can to help drum up support or uh, to fire back at people that are giving us a hard time about something silly. Uh, uh, you may also know me from the website pixels.us or pixels.us, as I like to refer to it, uh, the uh, community for free software, all things free software around photography and a little bit more cinematography these days. Uh, occasionally, we have a couple projects that are coming on. Uh, and I've been doing this for a while, I guess. I redesigned, I, I did the new GIMP website in 2015. 16 something along there and then since then i've been able to, to interact and play with a lot of free software projects so it's been fun well and pixels that's p-i-x-l-s dot u-s the the e is missing that's right that's right p-i-x-l-s dot u-s is that just to be cool or pixels with the e was taken you know the problem is, is a pixels was obviously taken right out of the gate that was just a, that was a non-starter <clears throat> but when I thought of the project, when, when I was first looking for domain names to, to look around for the project, all the domain names that were related to photography had been snatched up completely. Right? So they Aperture is gone. Uh, you know, shutter speed gone, shutter gone. All these different things were gone. And uh, at some, so basically, like, you know, the dot two, dot com 2.0 era, we ran out of uh, we ran out of vowels. <laughs> so I started looking for non vowel containing variations and pixls was the closest one that i had so well, it didn't work to work nice that's good for branding anyway because it's uh, no one else no one's gonna accidentally spell it that way that's so right that, yeah that helps so actually let's 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 start there though let's start with pixels let's start with mm -hmm. with um with that community you sure. started when when did that start uh that was august of 2015 I think it was August 2015. I'd have to double check my, my commit logs, but I'm pretty sure that's about where we, we did that initial launch. I'd kind of done a shift over where I had, um, you know, I'd done a ton of these, uh, these GIMP tutorials. So a lot of folks probably know me earlier on from doing various different, you know, little GIMP tutorials. That, and so I had done a couple of longer length ones that took a deeper dive into, into, into uh, a couple of subjects like digital black and white uh, conversions and things like that. And I thought, well, it's just fine on a personal blog, but people don't really want to go to personal blogs all that often. And it's not a, a constant source of feedback loop that builds that domain knowledge for everybody. 
So uh, I said, well, I, I've been thinking about this idea for pixels for a long time. Let me just kind of roll with it. And that's it ended up rolling. So about I'd say it was about 2015, about five years ago. And so that's is is it more for for support on how to like doing like doing things or is it more showing your work or is it a little bit of column a a little bit of column b i, I mean it's a community yeah. basically a community forum right yeah 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 so and this is an interesting problem right so what i did was at the time <clears throat> i looked at what you want to accomplish you know i i i realized that most of my computing personally I try to make as agnostic as possible, right? Like I don't really care for 95% of the things that I'm doing on a computer. If it's Mac OS, if it's Linux, if it's windows, if it's a Unix box, I don't really care. What I care about is that the tool I have is available to do the work I need to on the, whatever it might be. In my case, early on, this is, this is when I was in college, this is, yeah. I'd say around 1998 or 99, I was first starting to use, uh, it was a um, SGI IRIX oxygen box, I think. So this had been SGI IRIX, which is SGI's variant on, yeah, on Unix. Anyway, it, um, and these were oxygen rendering boxes that we had at the engineering college. And so that was all I had. So I began, you know, working on, on IRIX initially and then an, an AIX later and some other unices that they had around the university. So, you know, my tools were typical, uh, uh, term, uh, you know, terminal emulator tools. So Vim is my, Vim is life. Yay. Yeah. So, but you know, it's interesting. Cause I looked, I went and looked back. I said, well, all right, what do I use when I'm writing? I'm in Vim. Does it matter really that it's Mac OS under the whole thing or is Vim working for me? No, oh, it's just Vim, right? Do I care when I'm when I'm editing something in GIMP that I'm on uh, Windows? Not particularly because I have GIMP, and it, as long as it works almost exactly the same way, I'm okay with it. And if you extrapolate that thought to the creative process for what you want to accomplish, don't think about the tool, think about the thing I want to do. As long as all of my tools are available, the same exact thing became, uh, it kind of lit up like a light bulb in me when it came to looking at something like, you know, photography. So we'll use photography as an example, because that's what I'm into. Everybody that had domain knowledge for either, you know, information, tutorials, showcases about photography with free software, at least, right, with free software, was uh, stovepiped into communities built around a particular software project. So if I wanted to know how to do a thing, I might find out that some really smart guy at the dark table forums wrote a lengthy article on the dark table forums about what it means for uh, uh, color space and color science and why sRGB is not is not a color space right right so but if I'm a raw therapy user I'm never going to see that I'm not really I don't have an occasion to visit the dark table forum right if I'm a GIMP user I might not even know that there is such a thing as a raw editor that concerns itself with that kind of thing I'm too busy just in my world of GIMP right. so I said look the problem we have is that the community as a whole around the idea of doing photography or practicing photography or, or cinematography in, but half, but using free software only didn't exist. And I said, look, if we get those people together, what happens is the dark table team, the, the developers, the advanced users, they have an opportunity to talk to the developers of raw therapy, the other advanced users of raw therapy, the other advanced users of GIMP, or Cyril, or, or whatever the project might be. So all of these ridiculously, because what happens is the communities have ridiculously smart people. Dark Cable developers are just another level for me. It's same thing with the raw therapy guys. And they weren't in ever in the room that often. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll get them at a conference, and they might cross paths and have a dinner, but right. not, not commonly. And so I thought, you know, I want a community around doing photography, which I love. I I want it to all be able to be done in free software for a number of other reasons as well. But why not get them all together in the same place? Photography is the central thing tying us together. Free software is the other thing that ties us together. So let's get those two things and forget about stovepiping into, um, into programs, right? So now you don't have to go hunting down a 500-year-old GIMP mailing list to find <laughs> out how to do a thing, right? And a lot of these people are quite smart, so... Um, so that 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 was a reason for pixels. 
bring all of the people together because they're ridiculously smart. They know how to do incredible things. Some of them can communicate very well. Some of them communicate very poorly, but they can leverage people that can communicate well and bring them all together in one place. So what happens is, is, you know, on Pixels, uh, primarily it's a website with, a, 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 I was hoping to be able to provide a ton of high quality tutorials. But I cannot stand a, the hyperbole, which is the reason, one of the reasons I started it early on is Alexander Prokodin would have remembered this from an LGM in, saw in 2014 maybe might have been before that that you know uh, i hate if i have to read another article on uh, on the internet for like the most insert hyperbole here way to do some other real photography thing in gimp ever estimation point estimation <laughs> point BBC, right and then what happens you go to this page and it's 500 ads a bunch of awful you know just internet crap for four paragraphs of information, how to help somebody get something done. And it just sucked. It right. wasn't, it wasn't good. And a lot of people, what happens is because Gimp is free software, it's an easy thing to leverage for marketing something, right? And selling ads for yourself by just producing a little bit of content. And I think that ratio was off. So I thought, Hey, this gives a very bad image of what is really truly capable in this software. Right. Cause a lot of the time, those, those, those tutorials, that those little four paragraphs are also something that, you could have figured out by yourself or, you know, within three seconds of looking at the user manual, you say, Oh, well, yeah, duh. It's, it's basically already right. told you how to do it. That's right. And what happens is people miss the, 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 the concepts underneath the whole thing. So that's why they think that it has to happen. This is why a lot of people I have to have Photoshop, you know, they, they miss the concept of what's happening under the hood. So they don't understand how to be able to transfer that idea to something else. And then you get just shitty results produced for for some wonderful opportunities you know skins like uh, portraiture is something that i tend to do a lot so there's a lot of skin retouching in portraiture is a good example and most people pre-pixel probably said something like oh you just throw a little gaussian blur on there on the skin and you just mask it a little makes it nice and smooth and cleans it up and anybody that is even remotely into doing portrait retouching at all would just absolutely toss you out the, the moving car right and so there's much better ways to do it and so not only can we hopefully help you find better ways to do it, but we can also do it in a way that's not offensive to your eyeballs. So, you know, when you're not looking at 50 ads and I'm trying to monetize everything because it's so, and so that's, you know, as an example, early on on pixels, I had to make that decision, right? Do I, how do I fund this thing? Right. I need a server. I need the space. I need the web host. I need to, and because it's photography related and I want people to, to look, because what the, the trick was you have to lower the barrier of entry or lower the friction for involvement or engagement within the community. And this is a well-known um, phenomenon, I think, with a lot of, of web users doing UI UX stuff is that, you know, every time you ask the user to do another cognitive load thing to accomplish the thing, it's just another barrier to them possibly doing the thing. Right. So if your goal was to get them to engage and to get them as engaged as quickly and easily as possible, you need to get rid of all the shit that stops them from being able to engage either a post or question or answer or something like that. So part of that is how much cognitive load they see when they see the page. So early on, I said, do I have to, uh, do I want to run ads? Do I want to, you know, what do I want to do with this? And I thought, nope, none of that at all is in the, in the spirit of what I'm doing here. So, you know, I make a little bit of money in my day job. So I thought, all right, you know what, I'll fund this. However goofy it gets, because what happens is, is that it, um, you know, as a photography community, when you want people to be able to, this is back to the lower the barrier of entry. Right, right. When people are, are talking about photography, well, I've got this raw file, I'm doing these things and I have a problem. So, uh, and this is kind of like that pre-discourse era, which is what I like to refer to as the pre-discourse because I'll talk about that for ages, but they'll come in and they'll say, well, I got to host this 25 megabyte raw file. Mm. A lot of a lot of forums won't let you post 25 megabyte random files up there or 100 megabyte tips or something like this. And I didn't want that to be a problem, right? I said, shoot, man, I don't want people to not share their things to discuss things. And what's even worse is they'll go post it somewhere else. You know how many how many dead uh, 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 image shack links exist around oh, the internet? Yeah, yeah, how much link yeah. rod is out there? So, you know, that's and that's something for the discourse days. We can always chat about that later. But the idea was I want them here and I want the data here and I want to control it so that they don't have to worry about some other a-hole screwing around with their data. They can look at me and go, well, Pat's the a-hole that did it, which is fine. <laughs> I, I, I own that. But so that meant that I'm, you know, so for instance, on the forum, 
drop any image you want as long as it's under 100 megabytes. Drop almost any file type you want, almost all the raw files, TIFF files, zip files, whatever you need to have. Um, and there's no limit to that. And that what happens is, is that it's easy. If I casually want to share a 30 megabyte image that I processed in some astrophotography software like Cyril, I would just drop it in. Done. Nice. I don't have to think about it. And it's always there in perpetuity. You'll never lose the context of the thread. You know, someone goes, well, on that image, it doesn't look like you did this thing. And then you look up and the image is a broken link from image shack. You know, with the, that is, nice. I can't, that doesn't help me one bit. So it's here in perpetuity. So early on, I said, you know what? I don't want any of that. I don't want ads or any of that thing. I'm willing to fund this myself. Um, and so I did. I just made a promise to myself more than anybody else made it to myself, but to the community as well, that for as long as I'm alive and I have some money to, to, to run this thing, this thing is going to keep, keep on going. And that was, you know, whatever, five years ago, but I think within a, within a couple of years, some folks had stepped up and we've had a, a friend of mine, Demetrios Kogios. Demetrios basically was like, here's all the money for the year. So you don't have to worry about it. And then we've had like boss hub has stepped up and said, here's all the money for the year. I've done that for a couple of years now, actually. Keep forgetting to post a big thank you. But, um, the community self-sustaining, I guess is what I mean to say. Very cool. That was a really long thing, and I am very sorry. No, basically, no. get them all together around the idea of a thing, photography, and free software, but get them all talking in the same in the same place, right. and cool things will happen. Sweet. Well, and and so the, but so the 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 other part of that is that it is it's not like this is like competition for art station or anything like that this is specifically for how do i do a thing or how do i get this thing that i've got to do better right and well all right so yes it is eventually going to be probably competition for art station so we have you know we love we love we love showcases okay because that is a thing that you want to put as your best foot forward to the world that says you guys might want to come and have a look at some free software options because you can do stuff like this right right and you just give them this 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 eye this explosion of Wow, that my eyeballs are now pregnant. I don't know what, <laughs> I, don't know what I don't know what the euphemism for it was. So amazing, my eyeballs are now boom. My eyeballs are pregnant. But uh, but there's a, been and there's been quite a few shots like this, right? There's been quite like a, God. The serial team just came on board maybe a few months back, uh, so that we were we're hosting their official forums. That's the other thing we do it. it so we kind of host the official forums for quite a few projects. Oh, okay, cool. Like raw therapies official forums are on pixels. Dark tables kind of official forums are on 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 pixels. Uh, Cyril, um, Gamic. There's a, couple, there's a whole a whole handful of projects when you get on there. Um, and so users of those software will show up. You know, they'll come to Pix discuss, which is the discourse instance that we run. They'll come and go. Oh, I'm going to go over here and uh, I'm going to go have a look at my my uh, dark table forum and take a look. But the initial view they're presented is the whole form. So they may see, oh, somebody's talking about doing something cool with, with fast Fourier transforms for removing regular noise patterns in images. I wonder what that's about. That might not have any, that might not be in the dark table form at all. It might be from the gimmick form. Right. But they'll click through. Maybe they'll learn a couple of things. And, then, and so what happens is that it's all right there. The idea is to, is to stir the pot. Right. Right. So I've got this giant gumbo pot because I'm in the south. <laughs> and I throw in some dark table and a dash of rock therapy and a sprinkling of gimmick and a giant hunk of cereal and a little bit of hug in and uh, we get them all together and we just kind of boil it through and stir it a whole bunch and see what ends up coming out of it every once in a while. So very cool. That, that works. That works. Um, so that did I answer your question? I, I, I feel like I didn't no, answer. I, I feel like the, the question has been adequately answered. It's perfect. Okay. All right. <laughs> And even even as such, there's there's so much extra awesome in there. I don't I don't think anyone's going to complain. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I apologize for the awesome. I, I mean, really. <laughs> All right. So so, um, actually, I did have one additional sort of question related to pixels, and that's so. It is predominantly on on photography. But do you have like anybody in the community there doing? And you talked about retouching, but. Things that are more paint overs or or sort of towards not just sort of a pure like photography as a as a as a asset component for for a larger composition, for instance. Um. Yeah. Yes. Not a lot of folks have been doing it. I don't think, and I haven't had. I haven't. You know, I, I haven't done a chance to do a deep dive to find the guys that are doing like large composite images and and building things for other production pipelines in some way. Like the ones that come to mind the fastest are things like matte painters that's the i mean it's a part right. that i love like 
one of my hobbies lately has been finding uh, matte backgrounds for scenes or shows that I love sans characters. Mm-hmm. So like, yeah, like uh, I'm I'm a redi- I'm a huge fan of Scooby Doo. Okay. The classic Scooby Doo, right? And so if you remember the old Hanna Barbera animation techniques, they have a mat for the background, right? And then they animate the cells and they just using Disney's camera from the 30s, they would basically lay the mat down, layer, you know, basically literally layer cells. Right. And right, then right. shoot an image, ch- swap a cell out, shoot an image, swap a cell out. But I want that background. Right. Because those were often like way more detailed and interesting. That's exactly than right. And they're and and so they don't exist anywhere, like as a clean background image. Like I just want the white background of, of the Scooby-Doo intro. <laughs> of the spooky uh mansion scene uh so how do i get it right with the with the existing material that's been something that um i've been interested in getting anyway so those kinds of things are things that could possibly be built up from multiple photo montage images where they can just start slapping together interesting sci-fi backgrounds based on image work or um or other things so the community it, in some cases is um ridiculously technical so for non-specifically photography, just, just capturing an image-related things, we did with uh, a painter, uh, Americo Gobo, um, and a couple of folks try to get a digital painting section mm-hmm. of Pixels started up. But it's it needs a champion. This is something that I, I, I believe in, and I think it helps when in the context of community building, is when you try to fire up some new thing that's too divergent from the thing you're working on, you have to have somebody who owns that thing whose right. job and lifeblood it is to communicate that thing, sell that thing, to, to grow it, nurture it, and feed it. And so uh, those guys with the best intentions wanted to start a digital painting sub forum on, on pixels, but it hasn't had a chance to really spread its wings and take off. There are some people that get in there. There's some ridiculously technical and beautiful pieces of work being done around paint emulation, mixing emulation, color science stuff. Um, but for the casual person, I don't know that it would it would it would play very well. Most people don't care what the color space is; they just want the tools to work in a way that's consistent. Yeah, yeah. The, it's one of those weird things for like I've been doing visual work for as long as I have, but there's there's two communities where I get really sort of I, I start talking to somebody and I realize that they're 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 in that community and they're really they're really technical about it. The two communities that that really sort of I have to take a step back because it just my mind is blown by what they what what they know and that's photographers and typographers like yeah those guys are bananas so much like you on both of them like not knowing anything else associated like well it's it's a letter or it's just a picture you took but you start talking about like the technical technical intricacies of um, line width or what the emotional weight of the weight of of a letter is versus you know just having a f- photographer wax on for hours about what glass they use. <laughs> the, I'll tell you what the, the man, it, so the typography thing, it, I have, a, I have nothing but respect for these guys because it occurs to me, right? When you, when you go walk up to the normal, are you dark? Uh, yeah, the sun went down a little bit. I have light here, okay. but okay. yeah, the sun went down a little bit. Okay. So my, my room is fluctuating. When you have these, uh, when, when, when you approach somebody and say, Hey man, uh, I want you to write a sentence for me um on this piece of paper here's a piece of paper here's a pencil write a sentence for me but use a use a standard font when you do it (laughs) you know people have this conception that there's some kind of like platonic ideal of a representation of a glyph that is to say someone goes a letter t like everyone in their mind i guarantee you has this idea of this platonic ideal like there's some perfect representation of the concept of T that exists out in the universe <laughs> and that's in their head but ask them to put it down ask them to draw it big and you get this interesting cognitive dissonance where the ideal of T suddenly becomes a little more complicated when they actually have to turn it into a concrete item at some point that dissonance that 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 I that that universal ideal of T and a representation of it in a physical form or a pixel form are that creative bridge that typographers have to deal with. Right. Right. How do I represent this thing? And that's just for a single glyph. It has nothing to do with ligatures or the rest of the problems that they've got to deal with. But like, it, it's so funny to like when I, when I, when I wax on, I'm not a typographer at all. Like I know guys that are into this stuff. I am not them. 
but it blows my mind because I'll, I'll talk to, to friends about it. And they're like, what do you mean? Just, just type it, use the regular font. Uh, what's the regular font out of curiosity? <laughs> well, whatever comes with my word processor. And I'm like, mm, you do not like your documents if you just do that. But <laughs> they realize at some point that it's suddenly it's an art. Right. They go, holy shit, there isn't a platonic T that exists on the page. Right. It's got to be a, a serif or a sans serif or a, or, a, or a block or, you know, and then it, all the intricacies that fall down there and they lead on a rabbit hole. And you go, man, this is a ridiculous amount of art and craftsmanship that goes into this. It never fails to amaze me every day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it is a nearly psychotic level of, of, technical craftsmanship and i i have that same experience when i talk when i talk to photographers because it's it's granted it, it it two different worlds two very different worlds it's still visual but two very different worlds but very sure. similar kind of mindset in terms of you know yeah i just took a picture but no 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 there's there's all this other stuff that's there don't let them fool you most of the time 90 98 <laughs> percent of the time what really happened was they saw something cool and they were quick enough to press a shutter button <laughs> they'll talk for hours afterwards i use a uh, 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 ed glass to keep the diffraction and diffusion down to minimal so that the shadows uh retain as much detail as humanly possible without getting slightly washed out due to some weird chromatic aberrations on the edges of the lens or the vignette and cause some things that they'll do that all day long <laughs> but the problem with that here's the thing i got into free software because I desperately believe at the core of my being that every single human being has a fundamental right to be able to play with a computer and use it in some way, either for fun or for work or something. And most importantly to me is that it's accessible. As long as you have internet, if you can, it's accessible. I want that knowledge to be available to anybody. If there is a 10 year old kid in Kenya who just got a used camera or an old cell phone and wants to play with photography a little bit because he saw a couple of cool pictures and he wants to try it out. I want to give that kid every single thing he needs, if I can, to be as successful as possible to be creative with that stuff. If there's a little, uh, you know, a little Russian kid in Moscow that decides that he wants to just, or a, a housewife in Canberra that says, you know what, I enjoy the scenery around here. I'm going to go out and shoot some pictures of. I want them to be able to come to us and get all the things they need to do as good a job as they can or to understand it as much as they want. But that barrier to entry, that friction thing is something that I talked about earlier. It's important. I don't want them to worry about all that crap. You know, a lot of people will get just caught up in all this discussion a million times about all the details of the things that are happening. And I've said this before, you could give me the most technically perfect photograph in the world. Radiographically correct in all the correct color spaces and just the perfect but if there's no emotion in it, it's not going to resonate with me one single bit. It could be just right. a blank wall, but it's technically, it's perfect. But a technically perfect blank wall, I'll take a completely technically horribly imperfect emotional image any day of the week. Some of those good examples are uh, Ray Kaffer's pictures of the D-Day invasion, the 11. It's, it's called the famous 11 because only 11 frames survive uh, getting back to the life offices when we sent the right. film back. They're awful. They are gritty, they're grainy, they're exposed as shitty as you could possibly expose, which I think was T-Max, what he shot on, but I could be wrong, could have been Tri-X. Awful, awful on all the, all the fronts. It's blurry, shutter speed was slow, dragged real bad, nothing was clear, nothing was in focus, and uh, it perfectly captured just how horrific the thing was that he was in at that exact moment. Mm -hmm. And you can feel it when you look at some of those photos as opposed to another landscape that's perfectly technically perfectly shot and you know okay i get it so don't worry don't worry about all that stuff that's the thing i want to tell people grab a camera go shoot what you think is cool right, right whether it's little whether it's big grab it snap it when it doesn't if you like it great what do you like about it do it some more if you don't do it again have fun that's Alrighty. the most important thing. Yeah. Well, actually, that 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 that's a great segue, though. So I talked about. So you you do a lot on portraiture, and and what what does your workflow look like? General sort of. Can you give us sort of like a um, soup to nuts, beginning to end? This is yep. this is the beginning, and this is the end. Sort of. What's what's the general yep. workflow look like for you? 
Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of things. One uh, is the workflow where I say, I must make this image. And I have it all in my head already. And I go, I want this kind of image. I want you know this kind of Rembrandt lighting, and I want this kind of thing. So I, I get very anal retentive and very Stanley Kubricky control freaky on uh, you know what I'm going to do. That doesn't happen that often. And usually that's me trying to emulate something someone else has done in order to learn something about the, the, either the light or the technique that they might have used. Um, so the other early on stage is I will legit be walking around or doing something and I'll look over and I go, huh, that light's really pretty. I wonder what it would look like if I put a person there and just did this to them. That's the crux, the very beginning early on. Either I find I find a really interesting or pretty looking piece of light and I want to stick something in it, or I have a rough idea of what I want to approach and I go ahead and, and just start building out what I want to look like from there. So if I'm, uh, so, so let's just, you know, a simple headshot. Um, maybe a headshot on my wife or something like this. So I'll say, all right, you know, I, I want to try playing with this big diffuse light and softening that shadow transition. And uh, I like, I, I, personally prefer having single light sources quite a bit because i like to focus on the so you know portraiture when you approach portraiture or any type of talk and i ask yourself what, what the focus of that thing should be so a good example is when you go to take portraits or a headshot in particular um what you want in a headshot is to represent uh you know the head it's not a it's not an elbow shot <laughs> you know it's not it's not it's not my shoulder shot but it's here and so you want to represent this as well as you can. So all of the focus of what you're doing should be on this right here. And, you know, one of those rules that Ray Capra used to like to talk about was that if your uh, photos aren't interesting enough, then you're not close enough. So, you know, this is way more interesting when you're looking at just me than having a view of all the background at the same time. Right. So I'll focus on that and then I start shaping, shaping the light as it occurs around a person, I'll find a nice area to set up. You know, honestly, it could be anywhere. Some uh, a, a bedroom wall outside, again, wherever I, I think, because I'm, I'm focusing on this part right here. And I'll convince somebody to come and be my guinea pig for an hour. That's usually the harder part, to be honest. Right. Get them in there, get them sitting down, kind of build a rapport with the person. If it's my wife or my neighbor or a friend, it's usually not hard at all. We're already pretty comfortable around each other. And uh, so I'll set up, get them going, and then I'll I'll, I'll 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 fire off a couple of test areas with my lights. Or if I'm outside, like if I'm out here shooting right now under this with this, I'll have them move around and do a couple things, move back and forth from the um, from the background and maybe drop it down to a darker color or bring it up lighter when I expose. Uh, and kind of get to where I don't have to worry about the camera, right? Because what I want to do is I want to get it so that all this framing, I mean, oh, I got this, you know, like, this is not a mistake. You see these lines? Right. Where yep. do they go? Yep. This is not a mistake. I did this on purpose, right? I chose this so that these lines are forcing your eyeball at the top of the frame to kind of come down and follow it to my, my noggin. My forehead. <laughs> this thing here, right? Um, and then there's two different backgrounds here. Just to be a little bit of visual interesting. This is a bland background here, and there's some bamboo shoots coming up over here, but it kind of gives you an interesting left-right difference. All this was done on purpose, composition-wise. So I'll do the same thing when I'm setting them up. Find an interesting composition, find a like it, I'll set up. And then uh, at that point, it becomes that whole, like, you know, that Peter Hurley does a bunch of headshot videos um, where he's, you know, how to interact with your people. But it's literally just having enough of a rapport to get them to open up and produce much more realistic looking um, expressions. Because, you know, asking someone to smile gets you, <laughs> which is awful, right? But telling somebody an awful joke like, you know, what is a, yeah, telling some. <laughs> I just tried to think of a joke, and I literally half a dozen ridiculously inappropriate jokes popped into my head to, say, to make myself laugh, but I'm doing it now anyway. But that <laughs> smile looks way more genuine than, right. than, you know, hey, he says cheese. So a lot of it is how do you get a genuine emotion out of a person so that it's a much more authentic-looking uh, face. So whatever, set it up, sit down. Now I spend the next 40 minutes just chatting with them, talking with them, making jokes, asking them to think about things, you know, like, What's the, 
you know, ask him to think about what it must feel like to, to, to kick a puppy hard enough to kill it. Jeez. You get a face, you get some right. emotion. What you're trying to do is evoke an emotional response internally that will um, reflect itself in the kicks and facial mannerisms so that you can capture that exact moment when that emotion hits. And some photographs nail it, but that's the thing I'm chasing in doing portraiture. I'm trying to chase that exact moment when an emotion flows through out of a person and is reflected in their outward appearance. And it's only a minor little, tiny little time frame of a tick where that might happen. Just a tiny bit of reflection. You know, tell me about your dad. You wait, right? They'll start to think, well, you know, and you probe a little and you start to unravel these little layers. And occasionally you'll get a little tick of true raw emotion. You just want to snap it at that. Or the happy side. I mean, I'm going sad because that's I, me, I guess. I'm macabre. <laughs> but happy, joyful, you know, all these different things. Anyway, so once you have an image, I got a raw file. My normal workflow has always been to do, um, if I'm not using Digicam, I will use just uh, thumbnails. I'll make contact sheets and image magic just so I can just quickly, very quickly go, Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. And just focus as fast as I can and call down to the, the like one or two images out of the set that were any good. And that's literally just flipping through, you know, a, a good size thumbnail of it and just trying to see if my eye says the composition's good. So let's work on it or if the composition's bad. Because at that point, it's purely a composition thing. I haven't exposed it. I haven't done any right. color correction to it. It's just purely a composition and expression thing literally the raw files click 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 click. find one ah, that's the one so i come out of digicam if i want or out of my uh file explorer thumbnail viewer my image magic contact sheet take that image and for me despite being good friends with these nerds uh, i'm also good friends with the raw therapy team so for me for the Pretty longest much, time everybody's on audio only he just he has a dark table shirt on so just to point that out that's but not just a dark table shirt. I'm going to point out it is a dark table shirt from the Graphics meeting in 2014 that Ooh. Uh, I think I purchased for twice the price they were selling it for. So very cool. Not because I was being generous, but because uh, Tobias told me that it was twice the price and I believed him. <laughs> so I saw going to raw therapy at that point. Um, and then it, it depends on what I'm feeling like, uh, what the image is and, and, and what I want to go. But there's a lot of, nerdy boring stuff that happens here you set all the white balance early on if i can i get the levels clipped and set where i want them to be i set the black points i'll um i'll set the exposures so that i can try to push things um uh either dark or light depending on my image or or you know towards some some region that i need like if i exposed because you know i used to shoot film well that's all i had the option to shoot for the longest time so you know we always um uh, exposed for the highlights and then develop for the shadows. Wait. Yeah, I'd expose the film for the highlights and then I would develop it for the shadows. Um, that's an old Ansel Adams thing, I think, but I could be wrong for the zone system or something. But long story short, uh, I play with all those things. White balance, uh, exposure, and then kind of start dialing in the image for the overall exposure that I like from a global perspective. Then start fiddling with my my colors at that point to like get to something that I enjoy, um, and I'll spend a long time messing around with that. Uh, and then after that, I'll come out of that into GIMP and do any 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 minor imperfections, retouching. There's a whole I've written way too much stuff about frequency separation for retouching skin for portraiture, so I'll dump into that and and kind of smooth out the the broadest details levels of the skin to kind of just even the tone overall. So, you know, because when, when you spend a lot of time looking at a lot of faces in close up headshots, you mm -hmm. learn a lot about people's skin right, and what, right. what, what's happening. And it's, it's not just the glance in the mirror in the morning when I got done brushing my teeth and shaving, but I mean, now I've got a static image for all time of you and all of your glory. No matter how many pimples you might have or blackheads you might have or weird ingrown hairs you might have or, you know, eczema or, or flushed cheeks or whatever the case may be, it's there. So the question becomes, how do we, you know, do I want to leave it? Which is fine. No problem with leaving it. Do I want to dull it? It's not as, do I want to remove it? 
pimple shouldn't be there. Let's get rid of that freaking pimple. Not, it, it, it's entirely a taste thing. So uh, Digicam or contact sheet for initial culling, raw therapy for the raw development, uh, exposure, color tonings, things like that. Indigimp for uh, uh, minor retouches, frequency retouches, um, any cropping recomposition that I want to do there. And then out to a final final image. That's my that's my shortened workflow. <laughs> hey, it's that's 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 a good it's a good overview. It's a good overview yeah. of the process. That's cool. Means I can, that's that that also gives gives uh, again the photography is one of those things that I've 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 dabbled in. I did develop film at one point in time, never got into colors all black and white because that was just easier. Uh, mm -hmm. but yeah once digital came around, I stopped really exploring it as much, which I have to, I have to remedy that at some point. Uh, just if only for doing random product shots or goofy things that I've made. Uh, yep. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so actually let's, let's, let's talk about tools a little bit. And cause you're, sure. you're if, aside from, from pixels, the other thing that you're, you're very heavily involved with is, is the GIMP community. Um, yep. Mostly, I mean, obviously with the with pixels you're you're working on the user land side of things but you're also pretty pretty heavily involved with the the development side are you no well are you, uh, are you actually developing it or are you just mostly you know helping yeah. as, as support on that front it's helping support on that front for the most part right like it it, it a i would never trust myself to, to actually hack into the uh, uh the sea source of, of gimp it's probably not a good idea at all and everything should be uh, reverted immediately but um what happened was is that it was mostly from a um uh like a pr side so you know uh, do you know alexander prokadine from uh, we, Libra we, graphics we world and, around each other on the internet but i've never actually spoken to him directly okay right so you know he's mostly had been doing pr for gimp for for the longest time and managing it and we're you know like i said the gimp team i can't stress this enough i don't know if, i don't know if we were recording when i mentioned it earlier but I think probably of almost any project that I've ever seen or that I've ever seen personally, uh, the number of active developers, the ratio of number of active developers to the amount of hate that the internet gives it, I think the ratio is highest in the Git project. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because there's really only six or seven active developers just constantly hacking on the software. But uh, the numbers of users is huge. And the number of hate is, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than that. So, you know, uh, it's... It, it, and it's tough because we why, don't have. Why do you think that is? Just out of curiosity, just your your sort of gut check yeah. opinion on that. Yeah, yeah. It, it. I think there's there's two things at work here. One of them is that um, there are legitimate complaints, very much about about the way that that GIMP works in some things for a modern photo editor, and I completely understand it. You know, my favorite one is um, you know adjustment layers, which is seems like it's a no brainer now, but you know it. A few years back, it wasn't the case. It wasn't just all a given that adjustment layers were a thing. It was it was a, a relatively new concept, relatively right. in, in in image processing. So that's a perfectly legitimate complaint. You know, if I do if I do a, a, a tone curve adjustment or add a Gaussian blur to a layer and it affects something else further up my layer stack, and I want to come back and modify this blur to be bigger blur, I can't. Right. Right. It's set. Whenever that blur was set, when I apply it, that's just what it is. If I want to fix it, I'd have to redo it and then let it bubble up to the stack, uh, which sucks. Now, we've thrown to work around it, but whatever. So there's there are true technical problems that, that folks have. And, and the thing is, is that the team's certainly aware of it. It's not like they're tone deaf. They know that that's a technical issue. They would like to not have that. But can't stress this enough. There's like six people total that are actively doing anything. And I I, I would hazard to include, uh, you know, Alex, Alexander, and myself in that six total, right? So, you know, the actual developers hacking on the code is not a big number. You know, Mitch, John, Manny, a couple of other folks, L doing some ridiculously good stuff, so Pippin working on the on the, uh, the giggle stuff on the back end. So, it, um, we just don't have the bandwidth to to do it, and we're carrying along a, a ton of legacy craft. That, that right. we, we don't want to have to. So a, a reasonable person looks at it and goes, yeah, all right, I understand that, you know. But I would say on the whole, the Internet is the least reasonable person I've ever met. So <laughs> the opposite of that is that um, 
there are people that are parroting what they've heard from people that they thought were better or respected in some way in other avenues. And those people's opinions were nasty. So it became fun to continue to beat up on that person thing, in this case, Kim. So this is a case where, you know, a while back, some guy in a forum somewhere was a Photoshop guru. Someone goes, what about this thing called GIMP? And he goes, this thing is complete shit. The interface looks like it's from 1998 and it doesn't do all of these things. It's useless and writes it off. And that person goes, well, this smart person told me that the interface is from 1998 and it's useless. And then they parrot it the next time they go somewhere else. They go, well, this smart guy knew said it was useless. And then somebody else goes, well, that guy said it was useless. That guy said it was useless. You can't really use it. And it becomes a whole thing. The, the worst part about it is, is separating the two, because in most cases, the idea that it's 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 not good stems from some technical thing that's true. So a good example is 8-bit processing, 16-bit or, and a high-bit depth right, processing. Right. That wasn't the norm for a long time. It was only relatively recently yep. that we finally got it. And it was a 100% valid complaint. Now, does it make it useless? I don't know if I go that far. That's a little hyperbolic, but it, right. it hurts you to do some things. But the problem is, is that the technical masters that know that know that there are limitations for only being able to work in 8-bit depth, and I can try to work around it, or I can maybe go to a different you know, thing to work on it. But the other 99% of the people that are out on the internet who are literally just like, I took a snapshot of my dog and I put a funny border around it, but I can't use GIMP because it's only 8-bit. It's a problem because right, they, right. they were never going to leave 8-bit Photoshop either, to be right. quite honest. Or they'd have a JPEG out of their camera, and that's the best source they're dealing with. And they're going, well, it, it can't be professional if it's not. I'm hoping to dispel oh, some of those myths, oh, right? Professional. Oh. Yeah, no, don't even get me started. <laughs> we actually, I think we struck that out of all of the internal stuff in GIMP. Like, we we're not allowed to say that, you know, professional necessarily, at least in that context anymore, because it's or th that one and a de facto standard are the oh, two things yeah. that drive me yeah, those insane. Are, those are, like, yeah. Those because no. Nobody, nobody cares what brand of wrench my mechanic used to fix my car. I don't care at all. I do not care. All I care about is my car's fixed and it'll run okay. Right. I don't care if it was a Craftsman or a Snap-on or some other DeWalt drill. I don't care. That did not matter. What mattered was my crankcase got fixed and my car is running. Right. Exactly. That's how it is in various aspects of the pipeline. Unless, But the thing is, is that, you know, I understand, right? I don't want people to think I'm tone deaf. I understand when you're dealing with an art director and you've got an asset pipeline where you've got this feedback loop where I do a thing, I send it up to the art director, art director, you know, I want to change these things and make some modifications, and sends it back and you have this loop that happens. In some cases, that's a very real restriction when you're not using the same software that allows all the people to work in it, right? Because normally I'd say, look, when I finally print my photo, that printer doesn't care what software I use to get to that final image that I'm printing. Right. It's not going to say, no, we don't print anything but fancy Photoshop software photos, <laughs> or you didn't paint this with the right software, so we're not going to print this. No, none of that matters. And when it's hanging on a museum wall or hanging on your wall at home, nobody goes up and goes, huh, oh, that's fantastic. What, what piece of software did you use to crop this? Nobody <laughs> thinks about that. <laughs> That's not a thing anyone does. I've right. never done it. I can't imagine anyone walks into someone's home and goes, well, this wasn't done with Photoshop. It's an awful photo <laughs> hanging on the wall, right? So you don't care when you get to that stage of the pipeline. But if you're in part of an asset workflow where there's a big pipeline happening, a lot of feedback happening, it has to be a piece of, of monoculture software sometimes to ease that. Like I could throw a, a, a ping or a tip or uh, right. a bitmap or whatever over the fence of the art director, but... He may want to modify something in those layers. He may be perfectly technically capable of doing it. And if I throw him a flattened export image, it's going to be very frustrating to work that back, back, back. Because then at some point I have to say, we'll just learn GIMP. Right. Well, like, that's that's this, um, one of the other challenges with like, especially image interchange formats, especially when you're talking about like yeah. distribution formats are pretty, pretty open standard, pretty easily accessible. But like the the formats used for, for, not for for creation right and for yep. for maintaining that kind of thing those are like the the xcf formats like image dump so you can't really use that as an open format because you're not going to have an interchangeable interchangeable inter interchangeability with that psd is yep. on the other side of the fence because it's a closed format yep. uh, open raster had a i mean that's that's yep. got 
something, but you don't hear people talking that language as much. No, we sure don't. And then, you know, this is the same question that the video guys have, right? What are you using for digital intermediaries, right? Is this right. ProRes files or, or, you know, you're using as, a, as an intermediary dump for, for frame dumps or, you know, it, so yeah, it, I guess it comes down to speed and space. Yeah. Well, and then, but it's also getting people to agree to use those formats. I mean, yeah. hell, I usually just on the image, image, the graphic design side of things. How long did it take Adobe to adopt SVG? Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It was absolutely uh, awful. Even, but, actually, yeah. even at this point, SVG is still a pain in the ass if you try and open an SVG yep. in Illustrator. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. You're absolutely right, right? Like, how do we, and, 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 it's a tough problem to solve. You know, luckily as a photographer, most times we're living in our own bubble for that. The people that really have it hard are any of the asset pipeline folks from video or cinema, mm-hmm. right? Where they've, 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 they've got to maintain these assets and then they, they not only just storing it in digital asset management, tagging it, categorizing it, recalling it, but then using it in various pieces of software in that pipeline. And how do you, how do you do that? Right. It's, it's a tough problem to solve. And to be fair, it's not just free software. This thing, thing happens in my regular day job. Uh, so, right, right. Yeah. As an engineer, it's a very common problem. Interchange formats are oh. high, <laughs> highest bit depth, highest uh, highest fidelity, and just leave it at that. Yeah. That's, that's basically what we're stuck with at this point, right? But yeah. again, that's why I let 100, mega, 100 megabyte image uploads on pixels, right? Because someone may have an XCF they've done a ton of work on, or they may have you know, a, a fits image of, of some astro image that they've done. That's a stack of a bunch of images, but you know, it's a 90 megabyte tip file or some just generic. God, not tip, but it may just be a tip file. You know. Right, right. Well, unless you're like abusing the tip file to use layers on it, but it was never really designed to do. That. No, that's true. I mean, you can if you want. If you're actually, Git still won't open the layered tip though. That's still a problem for me. Uh, so I'll get. A layered TIFF that got sent that got created in Does Photoshop. It? I've never had been. I've always had to take Image Magic to rip apart the layers, yeah, and then yeah, yeah. pull that in. And uh, that if you actually look like, it up, they'll yeah. um, you can do multi-page TIFFs, yeah, and open those up as individual layers in GIMP. But if yeah. you have a multi-layer TIFF, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yes. I guess we could write a new importer for it and just invoke either. Get the code to, to de layer it. Would you write? I have had to use Image Magic multiple times to, to dump those layers out as separate uh, separate images. It's been a while since I've had to do that personally. Yeah, yeah. it's um, I it's it's I don't I don't have to do it frequently, but whenever I do it, I feel like ah, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It's exactly right. It's, it's not exactly. I mean, there's no words for a feeling. It's just this grunting and, and uh. yeah. <laughs> I'm on a keyboard. <laughs> Now you and I have been been sort of running circles around each other on the web for for a while. I think the first time that that we actually shared any sort of interaction, um, I was recreating something you had done with uh, you'd done some image averaging with Netflix yep. uh, images, and yep. um, I attempted to do the th- same thing with like the top fifty books in any given category in Amazon. Yeah, um, that's right. So that was th- Those that's cool. Sort of so. I guess that was my, my part of the other questions. You're not, you're not hacking on Git, but you, you do play with code a bit or just enough to get whatever you want out. Yeah. So I always approach it from what, what do I want to try? Right. And I guess it's, you know, I, I, I straddle an awful world between uh, engineering and creative purpose, you know, pursuits. So uh, I'm trained as an engineer, uh, but I love doing a lot of unusual creative things. So I, you know, it, the, the the blending was because I had run across this ridiculously talented artist. His name was uh, Jason Sulanon, and he basically was the one that originally did all of the Playboy centerfolds. Mm. We took every single Playboy centerfold ever done at the time that he did this, and he mean averaged all of them together to produce this one ghostly looking, which ended up kind of being, again, a closer and closer view of a platonic ideal of what a Playboy centerfold should look like. Like, what happens is, he had the presence of mind. And then this is technically the same thing that happens with long exposure photography, mm. right? Where what you say is, what if rather than freezing a moment in time with photography, where I say, boom, that is a one six hundred and you know fortieth of a second snapshot of the world through my lens. What if I said, well, what does the world look like if I kept looking at it for a whole hour? 
right? And that's where that kind of that long exposure photography idea comes in. Well, you know, anytime you, you see the shot painting. That's right. Exactly. Right. Like the gorgeous view of waves crashing on the shore becomes this, this misty, foamy, beautiful view and things start averaging out. So the idea, the crux of that idea was what if instead of snapshot a photo, that snapshot lasted a long time, what would it look like? Um, and so that same idea happens when you do mean averaging, because technically that's really all you're doing with a long exposure. Right? Right. For any given pixel photo site, when you leave it open for a long time, you're just, you know, the average of the light building up as it over that long depth of time becomes whatever that representation is. Even if there's spurious spikes of light for a second or two here or there at that area, it all averages into another value at some point. So what if you applied that idea, but to other static images? And right. so... He did that to um, two projects I love that he did were the Playboy Centerfolds and 49 Blowjobs, <laughs> which is another it's another piece of his. I, I want to say it's hanging at, at tape, but I could be wrong. But he basically took images of 49 Blowjobs he was getting oh, and averaging them together into this one weird thing. And uh, it was a pretty image. You know, you don't know what the heck it is. Right. But he that, that same crux of an idea played. And then I thought, well, that's awesome. What else can I do that to? So I did it to make sure I could do it in image magic. I'm like, well, can I? Like, because I want to make what, and it all came down to, I didn't have literally, <laughs> this all came about because I didn't have the money at the moment to pick up a neutral density filter for my camera to do long exposure photographies in daytime. <laughs> like I couldn't set my camera up out here at the bay and take right. a picture for 40 minutes because I can't, I need to have a neutral density filter and it's got to be a big one for full sunlight for mm. a 30 minute exposure, right? You can't, you just right. can't. It, without a neutral density filter, you're not going to capture that, right? And I was like, well, a good neutral density filter is a bunch of money and I got to wait three days for stupid shipping. <laughs> I had to wait three days to get a thing from all the way from Shanghai, China to my house. That's bullshit. <laughs> so I said, all right, how else can I get a long exposure image if I don't want to get a neutral density filter? Hmm. So my brain did the math a minute. I said, well, what if I had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of, of, of one, one hundredth of a second exposures or one, one you know, and then I just averaged each pixel site later. Right, right, right. Right. So I said, no, that, that seems to make sense. That should produce roughly the same exact thing. So I said, well, how do I do that? And that's when I went out and looked up, had anyone done long, you know, and right. found Jason Sulanon and went out from there. And then I was finally able to do a couple of things with doing long exposure photography without a neutral density filter, just by taking a, either a video or a ton of images um, over a longer time frame. Nice. And then at that point, I was like, oh, look, the astro guys have been doing this forever. And I learned that all the astrophotography guys have been doing this forever, you know, take a God, there was one on the forums recently. It was 19,000 images of a galaxy that they ended up stacking okay. um, and producing a ridiculous amount of uh, fidelity out of the image. But it was basically 19,000 little tiny one second exposures to finally get to the, the end result. And it was um, exact same idea at its heart. Uh, those are tracking photos, too, because the sky's obviously moving. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, Yes, but he doesn't have to be tracking. I mean, it's okay. better to track if you can, but he can always align after the fact. But there are some errors that start creeping in when you start, when the tracking starts moving to the edges of the frame out here. What happens is, is that this imaging circle right here is usually where your lens is sharpest. Mm -hmm. You get nasty diffraction, chromatic aberration, and resolution errors out of the corners. Okay. That's a glass you doesn't. Run, you run into that same problem with uh, motion tracking when you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, visual effects and those sort of things, you sort of have to yeah. accommodate that kind of thing. So yep. actually, I yep. wonder if there's awesome. software overlap and using stuff like LibMV, which is for motion tracking. I wonder, huh? Yes. No, like if you go all the way back, it was originally, for me at least, it was the um, the Huggin project and the Pano tools had what they called at the time, it was an algorithm developed by the University of uh, British Columbia in either Victoria, I think, I think Victoria or Vancouver, uh, it was the 6C algorithm, and it was an algorithm for point matching in two frames. Okay. So given two images, find the correlating points that match up, and that is the heart of all panorama stitching software. Right, right. 
right? That's how we, that's how we produce it. It's also the exact same heart of I'm a little bit older. So for me, it would have been the tomato branch of blender. That was, yep. that was yep. quite some time ago. So the tomato branch of blender, it, it, it's the same exact problem. If you just basically say any video, which is a set of still frames, right. And I want to track points from frame to frame. Then the problem becomes the same exact one as panorama stitching. Yeah, as long as you're not in the right. list. <laughs> so that's right. So yeah, no, they, they all come from the same kernel of right. problem, which is you know how do you identify uh, identical points in two images or multiple points in two images? Very cool. Yeah, I actually used it for. I was doing um, compositional analysis for book covers yep. uh, yeah. by doing the, the averaging because then you like. You see the, the top 50 books. Oh, in the horror category, most of them are Stephen King. And he puts his name in exactly the same spot. Love it. So it Love it. Stays. So cool. That result was so cool. And I was like, because I did the same exact thing for, um, well, like the centerfold is the same, right? Mm. So like you look and you went, for a horror, top 50 books, you know, it's it's almost always like a name. And it shows up as this, you know, a really distinguishable something is right here. And then some image in the middle and then text at the bottom. And that's right. always how it goes. Like, you know, did I do it with, uh, I did it with movie posters on Netflix. Is that what I did? I, I believe so. That's where I got, that's where I, uh, I, that's, I think that's what it was, that. but I'd love to do it. I kept meaning to do it uh, with actual release movie posters. So broadsheets that they hang in the, in the, right, in the right. theater lobbies. I thought that would have been a lot of fun to do or do it by artist. So like, mm -hmm. you know, do it by all Saul Bass images, right? Just, just, right. just look at his Saul Bass images. I think I did it with like pinup artists. So Elvgren and who's that other famous pinup artist? I don't remember, but I was like, yeah, if I take every pinup painting ever done, right? Was there a commonality there? And you, yeah. it's really cool because you start to see this 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 consistent commonality start to come out of multiple averaging at that point, right? You go, oh, he's always got the women's torsos in the roughly lower third, right, uh, of the of the frame on every one of these darn things, right? Yes, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, you see some real interesting sort of compositional discoveries on that, which is kind of, um, yeah. one of the things I want to do is sort of a next, and I, again, I did that years ago. One of the next things I, I kind of want to take like a, um, more of a histogram style approach to it. So now you have, I mean, you have an yeah. average, but mm -hmm. okay. You don't necessarily get the, um, you have the, the mean, but you don't necessarily have the median. So if, yeah. if I look at it and I look at an average and I see yellow, that doesn't necessarily mean the predominant color used on those covers are all going to be yellow. Um, right. I would need to do do more of an individual color analysis on a pixel level basis. Yeah. Um, that's right. So that's kind of where, where I wanted to go next with that, but then I got distracted yep. on other things. <laughs> yep. Squirrel. Yeah, pretty much. And that, you know, and that all came for me. It was interesting. Uh, so I'm an engineer by training, right? And so I have a lot of friends that are industrial engineers, and this is kind of, kind of cool. So uh, leading up to the current uh, awful corporate system we've got now, there was a interesting study where like people would be standing at an assembly line, right? And they're assembling some components. And they've got all these little bins around them of small parts. And their job is when a part comes up in a conveyor, they pull it off, they get these parts, they do a couple things, they move a couple things, and they come over here and they get another thing and they screw it all together and they put on a conveyor to go down to the next guy, right? And so industrial engineers in like the 50s were like, well, how do we know they're they're doing like how do we make it optimize their workspace and so that they minimize hand movements it all happens here they don't have to reach all the way out here too often or how often do they have to go all the way over here to get a part it takes time right. and if they're taking time they're taking my money and i want them working so <laughs> it was cool because what they did was they'd mount a camera over the workspace and then they put little tiny a little tiny double a battery with a little tiny little light bulb on mm. the back of their wrist and then they'd have a long exposure of the worker working Okay. Yeah. And what happens is those light trails started to show them oh. how often someone was the, the light trail from the little light bulb on the back of his wrist would show them how often they were reaching the different areas. And of course that frame, as it got brighter was areas where the light was longer and then dimmer was less. And they would analyze, put them all up on a board and analyze those hand movements in a work cell so that they could then minimize um, having to make these movements That's so that they cool. can get, yeah. yeah, there's all kinds of neat stuff that you start applying it to. It really is. So, but I'd like gonna, to see that. Oh, go on. I was just going to say I'd like to see the book covers with a with a with a color analysis as well. That'd be interesting. Yeah, I might have to break open that old bucket code and make sure it still works. The, uh, sure. the API changed a little bit since then, so we'll have to see. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, Thank scroll, you. scrolling, sliding, moving, some sort of verb back to uh, the, the GIMP project a little bit. Um, right. Well, Sashing. 
Fache, that's a great one. And it's not just Skip, right? It could be Dark Table or, or Raw Therapy or Huggin or, or uh, Critter or yeah. any of these programs. In your opinion, as someone who is in, you're 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 actually in a, in a really cool position because you're you're involved with the de- development development process, not as a developer. Which for for people who are in the creative realm, that's 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 our contribution, right? Not 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 yeah. every creative has to be a developer. I mean, every right. creative have has technical knowledge of in, in general, but they don't have to be a developer. So. That's right. What where where do you think is like the most useful contributions that that aside from just using the software and making awesome stuff to show off and say hey look I did it in GIMP or right? yeah. whatever what what sort of things can 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 users do? Yeah, absolutely. So it look the the question we have to ask ourselves when you ask me that question is what 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 do we want to accomplish? Right. Always, what is the motivation? What is the thing we want to do? If it's just that I want to make cool software, then nobody has to do anything. I just need to make my cool software. I'm done. That's the extent of what my purpose was. I've, I've, I've achieved that purpose. Right. If it's, I would like to get some new contributors that will help us write the code and make it better. If I want to get new technical writers that will help us write documentation or do a thing. If I want to help, if I want to get maybe funding so that we can hire people to work full time on the project, Right, so these other goals that we start to ask ourselves, what what do we want to accomplish? And what happens is every one of those things has a different approach. I am a firm believer, as uh, in my in my my day life of being an engineer and and, and a manager and an R and D guy, is move with purpose. Don't just move because I'm flailing and I need to move to look like I'm moving, <laughs> but stop, center yourself determine that purpose. Like early on when I did pixels, for instance, I wrote a mission statement. Why? It was my own project, right? It was just me in my kitchen, legitimately just hacking at a website. Why the hell did I write a mission statement? I did it because squirrel. Right, right. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to go firing off on a tangent and I'm going to muddy up what my purpose was here. So I wrote this mission statement to make sure that that's what I'm doing. If everything that I do does not advance this statement, my goal of this statement, then what am, I, what am I doing? Right. Right. So I sat down. I said, I'm going to take the time up front to clearly define that, center myself, say, this is what I'd love to accomplish and make sure that it's right. And I haven't really changed it in the years since I've done it, except to add the word cinematography. And basically it was, well, you can read it on the site, but it's, it's, it's you know, it, it, Pixels Out Us wants to provide a, um, a, a place for showcasing uh, tutorials and sharing of information around photography and cinematography using free software. Exactly what we want. So don't don't go off on a tangent. I've had my friends uh, that help do all of this magical stuff with me, um, Paper Digits or Micah and uh, Derek's. These are uh, both of them are wizards. I wouldn't be able to get anywhere near what we've done so far without both of these people. Right. I can't. I'll give them thanks towards the end, but. You need to go and talk to Mike because he's a ton of fun to talk to as well. But um, the idea here is if you know what the purpose is, then you'll know what things you have. You know, then you can start figuring out what you have to do. So if in my case, I said, I don't know what the purpose of GIMP is other than to make awesome software. They do that. But there's got to be something else. So I took it upon myself and I say, but I want people to be able to do it. I want more people in the community. Mm-hmm. So I want to be able to raise awareness of these tools because a lot of people don't even know they exist. And I want to uh, do what I can to help bring new people into the community in some way. It doesn't have to be development hacking. But what happens is if I get 100 people interested in the software, there's some percentage that are going to be adept at programming that could be a developer or contribute in some way to the code base. There'll be some other percentage. So like 100 people, 90 of them could give a shit less and walk away. I got 10 people left. Of those 10 people, seven of them just like to make cool pictures. That's it. It's all they'll ever do. They don't even mention the software that they use. Three people. One of them is going to be a developer. I'm hoping one of them might be a uh, someone that can write documentation or tutorials. And then the third one, I'm hoping is someone that not only makes cool stuff, but talks about it right. uh, vocal and vocalizes it to the wider world. So I always say in any open source project, you don't have to be a developer to contribute. You can 
just by using, like you said earlier, just by using and, and saying, hey, I use GIMP to make this. I use Dark Cable to make this. Look at this cool thing I made, and I use Roth Therapy, or I use Hugging to make this cool panorama. Get it out there, right? I use Gimmick to make all these cool art things. Get it out there. Tell people specifically that you use these these free projects to do it. Mm. If you want to go a little bit further, write about it. Right. You know, if it's not in a forum post, write a blog post, write a Facebook post. Say, here's how I did it. Look, go get this software, put my image in it, put these three things, and boom, you get this cool thing out. Try it with one of yours. And the level of involvement rolls from there. You know, you, you, you go to where your strengths are. And if you can write technical writing and you don't mind sparing a half an hour a night, come proofread the manual. Right. Always need a manual. Uh, <laughs> right. Or if you haven't or if you understand how, you know, how a histogram curves work, maybe write that section of the manual for us. And it can be casual. You know, part of our problem is, is that we want that ownership, but there's some level of purely casual drive-by contributions that are still meaningful, even though we much prefer to have a longer-lasting relationship with someone, right? Um, step up to the plate and own one of the things. Say, I will now be the guy in charge of the website, and that's, you know, and now I own the GIMP website. That's what I do. And so, but, and being there is, is a huge part of it. So I would say at the very lowest level of effort, use the software. If you find a bug, report it because we need to know about it. Um, if you have an idea, let us know about it. Right? That's just engaging a little bit in the community. Otherwise, make cool stuff and share it. Cool. Uh, yeah. So those are the. These are all. These are not uncommon, right? These are across all projects. Right. Right. right I right. mean, it's so. You know, the the document foundation is the same thing with LibreOffice. You know, we have the same thing with a million projects. Use it. Report bugs. Let us know what's going on. If you can contribute back, please do. It would be super helpful. Our problem is uh, that as a free software and open source community, that we are we lack what I've I've noticed is that we lack the um, the people that are willing to be the middle management or to make it uh, work into a vision that you want. Because it's in some ways it's very much like a commercial entity that it's best to treat it that way. So marketing and things like that, but do it in a good way, which I'm hoping we've done. But planning, management, outreach, vision, all those things, when you have a strong vision for a thing, you end up with a strong uh, product, but you may end up hurting things along the way. So you kind of got to be careful, right? It's like, because on the one... If you have a a dedicated vision, that that is necessarily exclusionary to other facets of it right um and that i think that comes par for the course but you you with a dedicated vision you have two things that happen you have things like krita who like they're they're very very dedicated they they have a vision they know what's going on and people you know the users for the most part play in that sandbox and and do what they can with it um blender for instance also has you know, Blender wouldn't be where it was without Ton, right? Okay. That vision is driving it. At the same time, there are so many like subcultures and sub communities within the Blender community of doing things with it that it it straight up was not designed to do. I mean, that's exactly from, right. From CAD to uh, yep. yeah, all all these other things that that video editing, right? The, the sort of things that that it's it's in there. You can do it and 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 be effective with it but it was that's still not part of the mission statement but you end up having yep. um you end up having what you were, you were talking about before the the people who are the, the stewards of that particular facet right the person yep. that that can do that sort of thing and so um i did a, an interview a couple episodes back with the the people who are from blender npr who are really trying to do the the non-photorealistic rendering components of that and yep. that that so i i think that's one of the things like, like you yeah you 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 are necessarily exclusionary by having a vision, but that doesn't yep. necessarily mean that's going to be the limit of what the tool can do. Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the extreme of that is on the one hand, you'll have uh, Mac OS or Apple products mm. early on, right? Where, where uh, uh, between Steve Jobs and Johnny Ives, you had a ridiculously strong industrial design vision. And that's what it's going to be. It was distinctive and it worked for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the other hand, of course, this is the bizarre, right? The cathedral and the bizarre. So the bizarre side of the whole thing is just the shitty 90s interface of GIMP. Right. Right? And you go, oh, what? I mean, it's changed since then, by the way. So any many of my GIMP friends that are listening, I'm this is just hyperbole. I'm, not I'm still waiting on GTK3, by the way. It's, I'm, I'm... 
with that court. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will give up GTK three or any fancy UI widgets if I could just get uh, the port to Gaggle complete enough that I could have adjustment layers in the back. That sure. that's the thing that's gonna just rocket the workflow. I don't care what the button looks like, but I do right. care about yeah. So the um and somewhere in between is an awful medium. Right. Somewhere in between is is Windows uh, Windows ME. Oh. Somewhere in between is, you know, uh, uh, some other aspect of that. So, um, you know, like it or hate it, uh, you know, GNOME's current desktop is fan. I-, I like it, right? But there's a lot of detractors for a lot of reasons. And um, you will have to step on some toes when you try to enact a vision if it doesn't correlate because not everyone's going to be on that same path. So how do you do that? You know, I, I hope to try. I, I don't know what the answer is. I've tried to temper that in pixels, for example, right? Because right. for the longest time, I kind of had the final say for almost anything. But at this point, I will refuse to do anything of any real large scale merit for the community without conferring with everybody that's in uh, in this. And in, in, I say the circle, but basically the the maintainers of all the projects that make up pixels. So like the dark table guys or out therapy guys, the gimmick guys, Derek's, Micah, um, all the people that I host their forums. Uh, if I go to do anything that's going to be anything wild i want to make sure that i have consensus from the entire team because it's their home and i want right. them to feel like it's their home right um but at the same time other things we can do on our own so like you were saying oh, you're not going to compete with art station are you well technically no i have been thinking lately that i'm going to maybe look at implementing a portfolio for all of the users that will tie back to commenting that will feed back into the form as well and allow them to have uh, uh, static pages with static URLs that they can showcase their work. And if somebody wants to comment on it, they can log into the forum and then, you know, leave a comment, have some interaction there with other forum members and then galleries and things like that. I feel like that's a, a natural extension of showcasing yeah. photography at that point. So very cool. Um, well, I, I think I've covered, uh, let's see. Yeah. Pretty much everything that I was going to ask. Is there anything that I, I missed that you wanted me to talk about? Um, no, but the pixels community, I just want to put this out. It, 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 it the, the, the trick, and I feel like the success that I feel like it's been has been entirely due to how awesome the people are in general. It's a scary thing when you fire up a forum because it, you're opening this thing up to the internet, right? And the internet's an awful, awful place. It's just a cesspool. It's, if, <laughs> If anyone was to define when the fall of humanity occurred, it was when we decided to collectively put all of our uh, worst tendencies together and then amplify it across uh, our own network, right? <laughs> and it was a case where you don't know. It's going to get scary because people can be awful. And I cannot stress enough how uh, incredible the community has been overall. Just people that are engaged, people that are polite, people that really, truly want to help uh, advance what our state of knowledge is for photography for free for everybody, right? And it's all available here. All you got to do is just sign up and come and chat with us or don't and just read it and use it. That's right, all we right. So, you know, uh, Micah, who's a good friend of mine out in LA, uh, was probably one of the very first people to jump on board uh, the project. Uh, Derek's, who is kind of our sysadmin, was uh, the guy who bef- pre-pixels, is all pre-pixels. Derek's is the one that was like, you know, uh, if you're going to build this website, you might want to consider a static site generator. Don't do any of this uh, content management crap. Better for the web. And I was like, what? And then I went down a rabbit hole, and then I got some help on a couple of things from him, and then, boom, suddenly we had a working forum and a static site. So, What are you using for static, just out of curiosity? My personal current flavor has been Hugo that I like quite a bit. It is ridiculously fast, and uh, I'm reasonably well-versed now in the taxonomies that it uses for, for doing these things. I built, I built GIMP.org in Pelican, okay, which is the Python SSG. I built DarkTable.org in Pelican. That was also the SSG. I built Pixels in PatDavid.net in Metalsmith, which is a node static site generator. Okay. Um, and I did uh, the Digicam website in Hugo. I did a new project that I can't talk to you about yet publicly in Hugo. I'm probably going to redo pixels in Hugo soon, Pat David and Hugo soon. And basically I'm just converging all of my mind to Hugo just because it's so stupid fast yeah. and the, the, the layouts make sense. Like I had to hack at Pelican to get it 
to X to, to, to generate pages that match my directories. Oh uh, yeah. On okay, disk, yeah. right? Like I'd have a directory that was literally like blog news, you know, downloads. And I wanted my URLs to be blog thing, news <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah. But I had, it didn't do that out of the game. No, wait, oh. no Pelican did metal Smith didn't. And I had to write oh, my, right. my own JavaScript plugin to make that work. And it was just a hot mess. So, well, but, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's ever, it's the most hated language that everybody uses, right? Pretty much. So, pretty much. <laughs> so it's 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 um, Hugo all the way, man. That thing is just bananas. I just I'm off CMSs completely at this point, and you know it's kind of cool from a technical aspect. I should back up. Uh, the Dark Table guys are great. Rock Therapy guys are great. Derek's is is just a master. Love you, Derek's. Uh, Micah is phenomenal with his patience with the people because Micah really interfaces with the people more often than not on the forums, and he has had to deal with some shit. Uh, you're a saint, Micah. Love you. The um, it's cool because if you go right now to uh, the Dark Table website or the Discam website, for instance, and you look at any of their posts, those sites were generated one with Pelican, one with Hugo, so it's a static website. But there are comments, and if you go to that website and go and have a look at the comments section, you'll see a whole series of comments happening, right? Um, and a discussion happening. That discussion is actually a topic on the Pixels forum. Okay. That is specific for that post on the Digicam website. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So what happens is when Digicam posts a new post on their website, it triggers pixels because this is a static site, right? So right, it's right, just saying, right. I have a new post. You're just HTML being served. Pixels picks it up, creates a new topic in the Digicam forum. And then there's a JavaScript embed down here of the commenting that's literally just the comments, the commenting thread from the forum. You know, I might I might have to do that because I was using using a Hugo has discuss mm -hmm. uh, integration with it, but for yep. some reason the theme that I've been using for for the for the podcast, the the discuss integration is broken and is is. Uh, it. But my problem with it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I, if I can, if I could set that up to work with like discourse, yeah, um, and do that same sort of setup, that that might that might work better. See, the trick here is this is for the users, right? Discuss or discuss is um, it, it's kind of user hostile. Any commenting system generally is user hostile because you don't know who owns that 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 system. So you're being tracked all over the web by Discuss, right? And you know Michael Schumacher at the Git Project, our, our tie wearing office manager, kind of the guy that I was reporting to with with Procadine mm -hmm. when we we're doing web stuff. Um, you know he's he's very very security conscious, right? Right on the internet, just super super security conscious. So for instance, the GIMP website works fine without JavaScript. Yep. We do no tracking. Uh, it's full HSTS and OCP um, stapling is happening for the, the certificates in the back. And like it, it, we are, if you go look us up at the observatory at Mozilla, I think we have a, either an A or an A plus rating wow. for all the things you have to do for security on the web. And it's, it, it was not easy because it meant I couldn't do any inline JavaScript. I can't do any inline CSS styles, everything. Wow. And so there's a lot of things you can't do anymore if you want to be super secure. So I picked up a lot of my security practices from, from Shumamal at and in the Git project. So for instance, when people come to Digicam and they leave a comment, they own that comment the same way as if they had come to the forum and, and created the comment. Right? So right. they can take those comments and export them with them. I'm the guy that has all the data on their comments and what sites they visit with with with, um, with pixels. Me personally, they know me. They can reach out, they can talk to me. I'm not a nameless face, I'm not a nameless organization. I'm not selling their information to anybody. Right. Right. And they really only have my name to trust that. But I've been doing a lot of work to make sure that I'm at least reasonably trustworthy to my users. Right. You know, Discuss will track you all over the web and sell that information. Sure. To people. Yeah. It's yeah. like using Facebook comments and these other things. So but it's hard because you have to host the comments. There's got to be a thing happening. Right. And either you set that all up on your own. And now what are you going to do? Track every user, make another login, give me an email and a password track. All Nobody wants to do that crap. Right. But for uh, Darktable, if the users are on the forum, they can already comment on any post on the dark table site because they're just using their, their forum account. That's right, really right. all it is. And it kind of helps to advance that idea of homogenizing that communication between users and the developers and other projects all under that one banner. And so the same thing happens with, uh, with Digicam. I can't recommend it enough. It'll right. be the same way for any further commenting. I'll, I'll, I'll continue to fire up, point them all back to the same root place. Well, now I got a rabbit hole to chase. <laughs> That's a long one. Yeah, it, it's not. 
like I wouldn't do it just to do it. I'd find some way to 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 because I've been thinking about doing it for my own personal website too. Like I got Pat David done. I have no commenting right now, even though I wrote some of the code to make it the the discourse thing work multi site. But now I'm like, well, Pat David done that doesn't really belong on discourse on discuss for pixels. That's not right. Not where that home belongs. So I'm not going to put my commenting there. But now I want comments. So what do I do? Right. <sighs> there's your business opportunity. Yeah. There's 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 a thing there. I don't know what it is, but there's a thing there. You create a discourse forum and community around uh, creative professionals um, sharing information about what they do at a higher level. There you go. I'll join. Perfect. Maybe it'll be a fun. It'll, it'll be a fun rabbit hole. Well, we'll see. It's, it's an extensive <laughs> it'll be rabbit all hole. Your fault. That's okay. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time I've heard that, I would have like fifty cents, man. The um, you know, God, you're talking about it, and now I don't know if that's not if that's if that's really, and if it's too ambitious, I feel like that's probably a thing that should happen mm. because, because the, the, the commercial guys do it already and they're doing it way better than we are. Right. So like, for instance, I looked at the photography thing and I said, well, shit, even in, but at least in my world, in a commercial photography world, like, you know, the, the Photoshop guys have the Photoshop right, forums. Right. The capture one guys have to capture one forums. So even they're fractured. Right. You know, and people will start to conglomerate around things like DP review or some of these other, you know, uh, uh, places. But even those have kind of, you know, is that really the most appropriate place for that? Right. I don't know that it is. And maybe that's a thing that we need to consider. <laughs> I, I, I had this meeting at LGM in, in, in Saarbrook and, with Bode from uh, Krita, hmm. uh, Bodawan, and yep. uh, all the GIMP guys, the Dark Cable guys, the therapy guys. And I was trying to make the point then, and unfortunately, just life got in the way, was that we haven't been producing a cohesive front to the world as a free software community right. in general, especially around creative aspects. Right. right. Just, there's, so I said, there's, you know, there's, like, there's no open source creative suite. That's right. And it's okay if there's not, but really there is. I mean, you and I both know that there, there is. Like right. If we were asked to do a task, we could each of us name all the individual components that would make that task up. So there is a suite. We just don't package it that way. Right. But what if we marketed to the broader world in that way? Like my question was when GIMP does a thing and posts something and they want to let their followers know about it, just the GIMP followers here on GIMP social channels, that thing happens. If it's photography related, I'll post it out so everyone in the pixels form does it. But what if there's digital painters that might not have known it? Like none of the Krita guys are going to see it. None of the right. Inkscape guys are going to see it because they're living in the Inkscape world or they're living right. in the Krita world, right? Right, um, right? Or the Blender world. So if we take that Pixels idea and broaden it up and say, well, what if, what is there at a larger umbrella level that we could begin? So like when, when, when Krita says, I am having a Kickstarter for the next four months to, to help us fund this guy for these things, I want to make sure that, that every other Free software project is beating the drums as loud as possible in support of their brethren to make their thing as successful as possible. Because in my opinion, just the more awareness we have in the world is just good for free software in general. Like right. Just raising that awareness. So how do we do that? Because there's no mechanism right now. Right, right, right. Unless, unless Bode or someone in Krita specifically reaches out to me to let me know they're doing that, I may not see that that's happening. Right. Even though I try to follow them, I may I may miss it. So is there a way that we can centralize the overall PR, not right. just the PR for the GIMP team or the PR for the photography team, but for creative PR in general? Right. And broaden its scope. You know, it it's hard to compare with Blender because Blender's got um, Blender's been ridiculously successful for a number of interesting reasons that I could talk about for an hour. Right. But it. it the interesting parallel is that um, that so they do all their own stuff very well, and the problem is is that you know they are uh, they're fantastic at delivering that message. Plus the the depth and breadth of Blender in general, right? It's right. not just a modeling tool, right? right That's right. a trick, right? It's not just like a, a ZBrush, right? I just go in and I'm doing my fancy clay sculpting in 3D. It's got a shit ton of other things. I think for ten years 
Blender was my video editor because it was the only one that was a free software that was stable yeah. enough for me to do my video editing, right? Yep. So I know the VSE very well. And uh, well, I'm already in the VSE, so if I want to do titling, I can do 3D titling. You know, I'm like, let me do <laughs> so. But what about the other guys? What about the Inkscapes? Right. Because we'll see their hack fests and they'll see their, but they're stovepipe in their Inkscape world. Right. And occasionally they'll reach out a little bit, but this is tiny, right? And, you know, we have a lot of questions that come across like GIMP where people are like, I want to be able to run these pads and do this, to change the stroke width on the padding and do make this logo so I could use it all these places. And it's always, well, you're in the wrong place. Right. I mean, you could do it here, but we're a raster editor. So get your, get your butt over to Inkscape. But when these things happen, are they communicated? And are we able to, um, to share that PR? Right load to maximize the reach and um, efficiency of it. And I don't know that we have a cohesive plan yet. It does require bringing together a bunch of people, right? It requires you and me to be in communication a lot more often. Right. It requires Alexander Prokadine. It requires Bode and the Critic guys. So uh, it requires something happening there. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it is an upper level, an upper level open source creative thing, you know, uh, discourse instance that allows you to to look at that from a holistic standpoint, right? Just a, a general creative standpoint. You know, the problem is every time we say general creative standpoint, and as soon as you put Blender in it, that 900 pound elephant ends up taking <laughs> over the entire room. Yeah, yeah. There was a hot second there when they were using, well, there was a, there, when, when RSS was still a thing. God, I miss RSS. Uh, and, and it's not dead. It's not dead, but I mean, how many you times? go to any, if you go to any topic on the Pixels forum, yeah, you can get an any RSS topic. Here. And you add .rss to the end of the URL, you'll get the most recent RSS feed just for that topic. And I wish that more people knew that and used that because yeah, because there was a hot second. There were like, um, like the the planet sites that would be these RSS yep. Uh, yep. aggregators for for all sorts of different things. Uh, yep. The problem is that those had the they were a true bazaar and they didn't have the vision of uh, of that level of guidance, and so. Yep. I, I think meeting, meeting somewhere in between on that is, is yeah. You get the fire hose from the plant. Cause I almost, I almost took over graphics planet when Mux let it die. That was three years ago. Now graphics planet is no longer here because I was too lazy to actually take it over. Mux wasn't able to handle it anymore. He's ready to hand it off. He was ready to right. hand it off to me, but then uh, internal discussions with Derek's and the guys in the pixels crew from a technical standpoint, do we want to take over graphics planet, keep it running. Right. Kind of like, well, no, not really, because it's going to be some extra work on our part. We honestly, we have a little bandwidth right, right now to implement the things that we want. So, right. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like, there's a fire hose happening. Right. And but the trick is, is that you know, I've been trying to, and again, I don't know the answer. These are all things that I've learned just just playing around, right? Yeah. Like for instance, I want to make sure I get this in with my GIMP friends. Uh, Hands down, I, I will say this uh, about the team. On the internet, they may be the single nicest group of people I've ever had to deal with um, on the internet, period. Right. Like, just kind, you know, nice folks, funny, you know, engaging, and, and you know, provided you spend some time, you're not some dick just trying to do something quick. They're, they're genuinely super nice and just awesome people. Right. Like, and, I learned a lot about netiquette and, and how to be, you know, remember to be kind right? when you're on the internet from them, right? Like just, and their infinite amount of patience that some of those people have. Alex's patience when he's dealing with people sometimes is just incredible to me. <laughs> so, um, oh my God, I'm about to lose that thread. I lost the thread. Nah. My brain was, I had, a, it was building up steam for something and, and I, uh, I lost it there. Yeah. Anyway, so it, there's something there. Yeah. I don't know what it is yet, but you know, it, it, we, we throw this fire hose of data out there. Like I've been trying to do with pixels, right? I've been trying to say, look, I've got, I've got info coming from, from Cyril, from Gamic, Dark Table's newest release is getting ready to come out. You know, we hacked it. It's release notes for weeks before. And, right. and you know what? So, but there's only so much we can do. So like I try to expand on that in my social channels, but it needed an amplifier. And that's something that we fail at horribly as a free software community. We might get one cool thing every once in a while and it gets amplified a little bit, but it should be all things all the time to as wide an audience as possible. And you are right in that you do want uh, an editor for that fire hose at some point, right? So you have this huge wash of information coming, but when it gets presented to people 
when you because what happens in the communication standpoint who am i getting who am i sending it to right who's the audience and how do i tailor the information for them if it's developers i just throw the dev notes at here's a release notes man go nuts but that's not what people are going to want to read so if it's a casual user it's got to be something else you need an editor to get in there and someone who has enough vision to say well let me take all that stuff and just winnow it down to the essence that will resonate best with the audience that you're trying to communicate with it all comes out of communication yeah. But I'm trying to learn that as well from the pixel side so that I can hopefully extrapolate it to an upper level. My longer term plan is to do something like that. So to talk to talk to the Jasons, talk to the Alexes, talk to the Bodes, talk to the Tons or Sebastian Konings and get these guys, you know, talk to the Andrew Prices and get them all in a, in a is there still yeah. a is there still a web ring? <laughs> That's get them the all on, <laughs> get them all on a, on the same ring, uh, so that when when that information goes around, it gets amplified, right? right? And amplification of that effort is our strongest power. It always has been from an open source, right? Yeah. Perspective: all bugs are uh, with enough eyes. All bugs are shallow, and with enough people, the amplification effort is way beyond what a corporate company could ever hope to accomplish. But we just don't, right? Not aggressively enough, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think with with that with that inspiring vision that we're gonna we're gonna pursue at some point, I'm sure. Um, ah. <laughs> um where where pixels pixels that us notwithstanding, where where on the internet can people find you and, and talk to you about all this fun stuff? PatDavid.net. Even though it has been updated in a bit, but it has all my contact information on the about page. So all the things that you can reach me on. Um, pixels.us if it's anything stock related and you can always private message me there I'm always available I'm on IRC on GIMPnet in the uh, hashtag GIMP channel I am on Freenode in the uh, pixels.us channel I am on Matrix at patdavid uh, at matrix.org patdavid at gmail.com pat at patdavid.net basically just type my name into a search bar if it's not a musician it's me <laughs> oh, or even cooler, <laughs> or the comic book artist. Oh, because there is a ridiculously talented comic book artist in California named Pat David. So patdavid.com will show you his work. I would love to take credit for it. I will always say I was not the guy that made these fancy uh, drawings of all these comic book characters, but and he's very talented. You should have a look. But patdavid.net, that's the best way to get a hold of me for the most part. Cool. Well, thanks so much for, for, for being on. There. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you giving me a chance to prattle on for way longer than you ever hoped I would talk. <laughs> you said I could go off on tangents, and I've almost got you two hours. Oh, no, that 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 makes my life easier, other than the fact yeah. that I have to edit this, which really yeah. is, is going to be like mostly. I think the editing is going to be on the color. Cur- no, my camera. <laughs> I got to tell you, I am glad you were wearing pants. That's stayed in. That's staying in. Um, right. But yeah, they um. I'll have to work on some color correction because I am you're 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 overexposed and my shots. I have it's dark. this right here. It's it's yeah. this damn eastern facing sky before noon and it never failed. And I had a gobo and I don't know where the hell I did with it. Yeah, well, I've, yeah, see, that I've been a lot better. sunlight coming in through a window over here, but I locked the exposure on my phone and the sun went behind clouds after that, and so now I'm dark. But you know, we'll we'll deal. The audio is the important part of this, so that's that's what we'll go with. I guess, but you have all this if you get the video. <laughs> And we will so. enjoy it all. And that's the show. Thanks so much to Pat David for agreeing to sit down and talk with me for nearly two hours and cover all the stuff that he's been involved with. It's super cool. I know I, in particular, had a great time in the conversation, and um, I'm especially interested uh, and found helpful the his talk about his workflow because I know the next time that I end up sitting down to shoot any kind of photo, be it for um, for 3d prints that i've made or rings that i've made or just shots of my kid or whatever uh kids i got more than one of those uh, <laughs> but if I, i'm gonna sit down next time I, I sit down to take those photos um i'm definitely going to be thinking about that workflow and seeing how i can incorporate that in the stuff that i do because um that's useful, right what parts of the discussion did you find interesting i am really interested to hear that. And if you want to let me know until I get comments working on the website, um, the, the best way to do that is to track me down on your favorite social media site. Just look for my name, Jason Van Gumster, or if that's a, you have a hard time spelling that, look for Monster Java Guns. Uh, if you want anything specific to the podcast, it's OSS Creative. 
Then when you find me on, on social media, tell me what you think there. The other thing you can do is join my email newsletter. It's go to the contact page on opensourcecreative.org. And that's where you get to fill out the form things and do the quick tracks and, and go and do that. And we'll be notifications some information that way. All right. In the meantime, it's time to get to work. If you feel like just going off on a tangent, I'm totally down for that. Oh, you got to be careful with that. I've been known to tangent. I've been known to filibuster for hours.